Perfect. Okay, do you have any questions on what we did on Tuesday? Now, the, the metric model is a complicated model, so of course you are not going to be responsible from certain details, but what you should understand is it's one of the original models which, were, which was able to make, to, to distribute or to control uh, the demand and the supply in a first come first serve basis. Okay? Now, uh, so in that respect, the metric model is, is quite, quite interesting and unique. And it is an example of a problem of a very large size that can be solved. And you can solve those type of problems in, in very short times. But of course, you have certain approximations. Now, there are a number of other studies that followed metric, which extended metric results. Uh, we're not going to spend time on that. Uh, but basically, the assumptions that we were talking about were criticized and they were replaced by other assumptions or some exact derivations were done under certain circumstances. So uh, there is still, I think, some work going on in that direction, even in 2005, I remember. And still, like, people are trying to take the same environment and give models that will describe some particularities of the environment better than uh, metric or followers of metric. Now, today I will talk about one of them. And this is basically the, the reason of preparing this paper was not to extend metric, but basically to consider another issue, which I will talk. But it is a paper in the same spirit as, as the metric. So this is basically a paper by Hausmann and myself, and it is something that didn't, that doesn't have a lot of contributions in, in terms of metric, but it extends it to another dimension. Now, what we have done is we have incorporated the idea of emergency orders into the metric environment. So what do, what do we mean by this? We mean the following. If you remember, the metric environment is as follows. You have a supplier. You have a depot. And you have warehouses. So what happens is that in this environment, uh, metric has, has assumed the following. If there is a part which is demanded by the warehouses, and if it is not available at the depot, or excuse me, if it is not available at the warehouse, or if it's not repairable at the warehouse, okay, what you do is you, you ship it to depot and ask for another item from the depot. Now, whereas real-life systems in general operate in a little bit different way, this includes the metric environment as well. And that is, if you have a demand here, and for one reason or another you cannot supply that demand, you usually give an emergency order. Now, we're talking about expensive parts, so emergency orders would make some sense. The environment is still for the warehouses S minus 1 S type inventory control environment. And what do we mean by that? Every time that we have an order, we also try to supply it from the depot or from the supplier to fill that demand. So there is no f concern for the fixed cost that you pay. Uh, the idea is to fulfill the order. This is the way more or less the uh, computer firms are operating. Uh, computer firms which as actually uh, consider very large uh, co consider very large computer systems and what the computer company would do is give a warranty in terms of the central large machines operations characteristics in other words it will simply say it it, it will the downtime of that machine will be only 4 hours okay so what happens is that 
if it is only four hours, what you have to do is, if, there is, if you can fix it in four hours, no problem. If you cannot fix it in four hours, then you have to give an order to, to the depot in order to supply either a mainframe, another mainframe which is going to replace it, or part of the mainframe which needs some kind of a repair. So what happens is that you usually have very short time and what the order that you give is no longer a regular order. You give an emergency order. I remember years ago, 20 years ago maybe, we had this computer uh, which was, I think, we bought it from Austria, if I'm not mistaken. It, was, it, it is a, one of the mainframe computers. So the agreement was that they would uh, keep the machine uh, uh, at most 48 hours down. They were not allowed to do to keep it more than that. But you can imagine that like if you are bringing a very valuable part from abroad, then you have all kinds of uh, clearance problems. You have to pay the tech, uh, export, import dues, things of that sort. So what happened was that once the computer was down, the local people were able to spot the error. The, the mistake and there was sort of a part which was needed which wasn't available in Turkey at that point. They didn't have it in their storage because it's a part that would go down, that would fail, which, which was almost unlikely. And so what happened was that they simply sent somebody with a, with a briefcase okay, from Austria to Turkey in order to fulfill their contractual requirements. So in that, in that briefcase, they had this part, okay? So it's almost, it was smuggled in a way, but uh, basically it was an emergency order. So what we did was basically to take the emergency order idea, which is not uh, the first time, of course, but try to put it in the framework of metric. So uh, the, the idea is that, again, if the warehouse doesn't have any stock, Okay, and then, then the, an emergency order is given to the depot. Okay, so this is more or less uh, the case. Of course, uh, excuse me, I, I made a mistake, I'm correcting it. If the warehouse doesn't have any stock, it will give an order to the depot. If the depot has it, no problem. If the depot doesn't have it, there is an emergency order which is given. Because then it means that it would go all the way to the supplier. If you wait for the regular resupply time, it will take a long period. Okay, so, uh, so, it, so what we have is we have two types of emergency order. And this one is ET1, which is the ordering time if depot has stuck. And ET2 is the emergency order resupply time if depot does not have any stock. So again, if the warehouse is out of stock, an order is given to the depot. You can call it an emergency order, but we gave the name ET1. So just thinking that it is going to be a little bit faster than usual. But again, if the depot doesn't have it at the top of the warehouse, then you have the time as ET2. So from metric, we learned that in order to resolve this problem, we need to find out the expected resupply time given these conditions. So it turns out that to write the expected resupply time given these conditions and given the results in metric, is, is not that difficult. And so we will define Tij as the okay, Tij is defined as the uh, expected time to satisfy A customer demand for item I in 
warehouse J. So basically this is the resupply time, the expected value of the resupply time distribution for the warehouse. And this is going to be the critical factor which is going to affect the back orders at the warehouse level. So when we have this Tij, uh, this is actually what we want to write. And again, I, I need to give a little bit more information about the environment. It's exactly a similar environment, but there is no repair. It doesn't change much, actually, if, even if there is repair. There is no repair. S minus 1 S policy is used. And the demand is follows a Poisson process in each of the warehouses. Okay, so uh, basically we have sort of countable uh, demand. So we don't have a, a compound Poisson process. So here, this idea is as follows. If I am interested in Tij, what is the value of Tij? Now, Tij is going to be, well, I have a number of different conditions. One of them, the part may be available at the warehouse. The second condition is the part may, may not be available in the warehouse, but may be available at the depot. And third condition, the part may not be available at the warehouse, may not be available at the depot. So we have three different possibilities. So Tij is going to be the expected value of this. So basically what happens is that Tij can be written as it will take zero time if the part is available at the warehouse. So this is zero times probability that warehouse has the item. Okay. And then we're going to have plus ET1 or let me write in general and then if the warehouse doesn't have a part, then we are going to have the emergency ordering situation. So then we're going to have the expected emergency order resupply time, which is something that is related to ET1, ET2. It can be ET1 or it can be ET2, depending, times probability that Warehouse J doesn't have the item, times probability warehouse does not have the item. So the logic is actually quite simple. What is done here is may simply reiterate the things that are done in metric, but uh, presented in a much simpler fashion. So from here, then I can write Tij, so the first term is equal to zero, then the, we only have the second term, and the second term it can be decomposed into two as well. The warehouse we know that is not going to have any item, but if the depot has the item it is going to be ET1, if the depot doesn't have the item it will be the longer emergency resupply time. So what, what happens is that then I can write this in the following way. Expected, well, uh, that, that, that was deterministic, excuse me. So this is ET1 times, uh, what is the probability that the warehouse have an item? Given that the Excuse me, uh, what is the probability that depot is going to have the item given that warehouse doesn't have it? So I need to write the probability term here and what we used as that probability is simply the summation x from 0 to si0 minus 1 and I will explain what these are. Probability of x given lambda i0 ti0. Now, this simply represents the probability that depot has inventory given warehouse does not have any.
Now, this is an approximation, and I will explain why this, this is an approximation. There will be other terms coming in, but let me explain this first. Now, SI0 is the stock that we keep at the depot level. Zero will stand for the depot. J will stand for the warehouse. Now, when the warehouse is out of stock, there is no stock in the warehouse, we're sure that at least one item from the depot should not be available there. So th this is the idea. In other words, if the, we don't expect that the depot is going to be full, we expect that the depot is going to have either, uh, well, either one available or none available. Okay? So what this shows is, this is the depot itself. This shows that the demand at the depot is in between 0 and SI0 minus 1. Otherwise, if I allowed for SI0, I would consider the case where uh, stock was not available at the at the depot. So this is an approximation. So this approximation is such that the inventory, we know that there is an inventory available there, and this inventory can be either 0 all the way to SI0 minus 1. This is actually, uh, excuse me, the inventory is in between 1 and SI0. So there is always a positive inventory here. Why? Because the demand during the regular resupply time of the depot is always less than SI0. So there is at least one unit available, and it, we can also have SI0 units available. So this is an approximation. Why, this, why is it an approximation? Because we know that actually if a warehouse is out of stock, it means that the realization that we're talking about is not a standard realization. So there is a bias actually in that, but this term doesn't consider that bias. So this is an approximation, but uh, numerical experiments show that this is a good approximation in general, if you have enough number of warehouses. Okay, so this is the case where warehouse has inventory, and, excuse me, depot has inventory, and then we're going to have ET2. If depot doesn't have any inventory, then, of course, this is going to be simply 1 minus this probability. And, of course, what we have to do is we have to multiply this with the probability that warehouse doesn't have any inventory. Remember? This is the expected resupply time, and then I, am, I should multiply that with the warehouse having no inventory, okay? Because this is the term. So that term is defined by, in the paper, it's defined by this H uh, SIJ. Let me write it here. This is H SIJ given. Uh, H i j t i j of s i zero. Now this term is actually a familiar term from metric. What we are saying is that the probability that we don't have anything left in the warehouse is not only a function of s i j, but it's also a function of the inventory level which is kept at the depot. Remember that that metric relation. Actually, that was what we have obtained. So this is actually the term that comes from metric. So specifying Tij this way, then we, uh, we can write uh, the... So this becomes actually the expected resupply time. at the warehouse. In other words, this term now is the term where we expect our orders to be supplied at the warehouse level. Sometimes it is going to be 0, sometimes it's going to be ET1, sometimes it's going to be ET2, but this is going to be the expected time. 
Okay, this is the way that we define. So what does this mean? It means that whenever I am now considering the lead time at the warehouse, this is going to be the time that I should take into consideration. So remember that only affects the parameter of the Poisson distribution, the time parameter. It's like the lead time. And this Tij actually takes that value. Okay, the rest of the paper is actually uh, deals with another issue. So this is a this is sort of slightly technical computation, and and in the, in later years there were much better approximations than this one published in different journals. So this is not actually a very good approximation in some sense because basically it, it it's it's a very simplistic approximation. Okay, but the the key thing that was shown in the paper was something else actually. Given that we we made the computations like this, the key thing in the paper was related to centralization versus decentralized or uh, centralized versus decentralized systems, and there were a number of things talked about that. Now. What I will draw is I will draw a typical so-called exchange curve, okay, and I will explain what this means. Now, on this axis, I, here I'm going to have total inventory investment. Now, what do we mean by total inventory investment in this problem is simply sum of Sij's, including Si0, okay, overall Ij. Note that we have multiple items, okay, but the items are not interacting, except the fact that they are accumulating the total, they are increasing the total investment. And here, we have some kind of a measure of service, and this measure of service is actually related to emergency, uh, number of emergency orders which are given or emergency time. Okay? So, if you recall, do you, do you know the notion of exchange curve? Do you remember it from in, in, in other course? Now, if you typically have uh, the following problem, let's say that you try to minimize You try to minimize a service level subject to a constraint on the budget. So we're talking about inventory investment. So we are trying to minimize the number of times that we use the expected uh, the emergency service because it's costly. You can give a cost to that as well. But you want to minimize that emergency service. So it means that you are going to actually maximize the service level. So we usually minimize 1 minus the service level, excuse me. In other words, expected number of back orders. You, don't, you want the field rate or 1 minus the field rate to be minimized. Okay. And but unfortunately, you cannot make in indefinite investment to inventory. So you are usually going to have a budget constraint, which is going to basically create a problem where you have a certain budget. You have to allocate it, the budget in the best possible way so that you maximize the service or you minimize one minus the service level. So this is the typical problem that we are confronted in supply chains. So, usually, this budget constraint is not a hard constraint, of course. In other words, if you give me a little bit more information about what is the effect of an additional budget unit to the service, then I'm going to change my mind as a decision maker and tell you that, well, we can keep more stock. Okay? So, there is nothing absolute in that. So, in order to represent these type of problems, we draw exchange curves. Exchange curves is actually a specific type of the Pareto curve, where what we do on the Pareto curve, if you recall, is that if we leave one measure, 
one unit less from this measure, what will be the effect of that on the other measure? So in this case, so here we have the following. Now, if we want to have this one minus service measure, this is okay, one minus service. So if you want to have very large service, very good service, it means that one minus service is going to be close to zero. Then what do you require? You require a very large investment for that. So as the investment level goes down, you expect to have worse and worse service. So this is called an exchange curve. And if you are interested in, applica in the application of these, you can look at uh, Silver Pike and Peterson. Uh, because I think uh, they have a number of things that they do with the exchange curves. Now, note that it is a very nice way of dealing with the case where you don't know how to represent service in terms of monetary terms. Okay, so this is going to be very useful if you cannot reflect service into some money. Okay, remember uh, in, in the paper by Turnquist, uh, Nozick and Turnquist, we had this strange W term that we didn't know how to specify or estimate. But what they did was they did actually a multi-objective kind analysis where they changed the value of W and solved the problem. Now, this is very similar to that. Okay? We don't have any measure that will combine our budget total investment to service. So what we do is we solve this problem for different budgetary constraints. Every time we are going to obtain a solution here. As we increase the budget, of course, the service level will improve. Okay, so this is the exchange curve. Now, the, when we, if we come back to the paper, in a previous paper by uh, Max Stett and, and Thomas in, in 1980, when these things were sort of very fashionable, especially the application of that, they have re uh, presented an application where they compared on real data the effect of a centralized solution, like this one, where you take into account the values of SI0 when you are giving your own decision, versus a decentralized model, which they called level decomposition. They compared those two models and then concluded that the centralized model was far better. Okay, that, that's obviously the conclusion. Now, what we wanted to show was a little bit different. So, what they did was the following. Let's say that this curve represents the centralized solution. Okay, the centralized solution which takes into account the relation between SIJ and SI0. So you assume that you know what SI0 is and you decide on the best possible SIJs. So you decide, you optimize everything simultaneously, as, as we are doing in metric or in this paper, in this part of the paper. So this is the centralized solution. And then they have another model where they assume that SIJs and SI0s are set independently. Okay, they, they call this level decomposition. Okay, and in that case, what will happen? They claim that they are going to obtain different types of solutions, and they report that they obtain solutions like this. Okay, so let me uh, okay in order that not to mix up, let me change the centralized solution to dashed lines. Okay, now what are these? These are the solutions that they obtain for the decentralized part problem. And using various different service levels. You see, for the decentralized problem, they are solving a similar problem again. They don't want to mess up with a cost term that incorporates the budget or the service with a certain cost. So this is actually what they obtain. And looking at this, they say, they say that, well, you see, centralized models are always better to use. 
Now, what we did was, actually, we took the same data. The data was, uh, <coughs> I'm not sure, but I think it was some kind of a military data. And I didn't have any clearance, actually, to use that data. So they changed the numbers and rescaled the numbers. That's, that's the way that we usually do when we are doing a consulting job. And if we want to publish a paper related to the consulting job, we don't use exactly the same data because it, it, may, it might disclose a lot of information for the competitors. So what you, we have to do is we usually uh, change the data, change the numbers, rescale it, actually, but not necessarily in a linear fashion. Okay, rescale it. But you should be very careful in doing this because you shouldn't be uh, sort of uh, uh, you shouldn't be losing the properties of the of the data. So what we did was we claimed the following. Our claim was the following. Now we said that there is a value in the decentralized solution because if you look at supply chains, the ownership of of the depot and the warehouses may not be the same. The owners might be different. So you may not have a chance of solving these two problems simultaneously. The, the warehouse problem and the, the, the depot problem. Now, metric solves it together. It assumes a single system. So our claim was that even if you have a decentralized system, if you can operate the decentralized system in a reasonable way, it will get very close to the solution of the centralized system. So what we did was actually, we took the data from Maxed and Thomas and extended their analysis by playing with different service levels. And eventually we were able to get to very close uh, results for the centralized problem as well, to the centralized problem. This was only to show that uh, number one, you shouldn't be operating a decentralized system which is not very good if you really want to make a comparison. If you want to make a fair comparison, there are better ways of doing it. And, but of course, still centralized is going to dominate. But the difference is not as much as we, we thought before. Okay? Now, they, they talk about 15% differences in costs. Whereas uh, we showed that using the same data, simply searching a little bit more than they did, okay, we showed that actually the difference will go all the way down to 1%. So this shows that even if you have a decentralized system, there are ways of coming together. This was an early paper, don't forget that. There are ways of collaborating, coming together, and finding a good solution which is not going to hurt the depot, but it will be for the benefit of the whole system. Okay? So this, was, this is not a contract, but those, those days were too early for the contract studies. But it gave an idea on the fact that some decentralized models can do pretty good, but you have to be able to operate with those decentralized models in a reasonable way. So the decentralized model that was proposed is not utilizing the information which is available at the warehouse level for the depot and the depot level for the warehouse. But if you can iterate, if these two levels can iterate, then it might be possible to get better solutions. So this was the conclusion. And although there, were, there was nothing very novel in the paper, OK, I can easily say that because I'm one of the co-authors. Co uh, still, it was published because I think it was important in the sense that there is still some value in the decentralized solution if you know how to manipulate it. OK? It still requires some communication, of course, but it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody at the depot level would s will sit down and solve the problem for everybody. OK? So uh, this short note, in a way, actually, is important in that sense. And if you read the conclusion section of the paper, actually, it writes about these type of things. But of course, nowadays, we know more about those issues. We know a lot about contracting issues, and so on and so forth. So in that respect, 
we know more in terms of what is said here. So we are going to see more contracting type problems, which is going to uh, make this idea much simpler. Okay, any questions on this? Now, again, this comp these computations here are a little bit complicated, of course. In other words, you have to know a number of other papers that we are not covering in class. But if you sit down, actually, you will be able to follow what is written in the paper, like the one in metric. And so this is sort of a way of making the computation. And uh, fortunately, there are better ways of doing it, in, uh, which was published in the later years. OK, now this, is, this ends uh, the discussion of, of, of this paper. Now, let me re recapture what we have done up to this point, And how are we going to relate that to the supply chains? So uh, which one should I erase? I think I should erase that one. OK. So I'll just briefly note the relation between what we did and the supply chain. Now, in general, if you recall the discussion of supply chains, we are talking about multi-level systems. So you have multiple levels. In each level, you might have a number of different type of organizations. And usually, in an arbitrary supply chain, the ownership of these organizations are not necessarily under the same the, the ownership is not the same. In other words, firm A can own this part of the picture. Firm B can be here and can be here. And firm C can be here. And we can even have firm A owing another facility in the distribution system. So this might be the factory. These might be the warehouses or central warehouses, these might be retailers. Now, there are certain cases where you have factories owing uh, or operating some retailers as well. Think about uh, some brand names like uh, uh, Nike, for example. Now, you can find Nike owns the factory. It also has some retail stores. But you can also find Nike products in, super, in, in large department stores, like Boiner. Okay? So what happens is that they actually own the factory. They own a retailer. They don't have anything else in the, in, in the supply chain. There might be some uh, other ways of supplying uh, other retail stores. So it might be an independent distribution system. Now, given this, the problems that we dealt with, like uh, Clark and Scarf, Maxted, uh, uh, Sherbrooke metric paper, and other papers that were given in the recommended uh, reading, simply does the following. It, cons it assumes that this system is operated under one uh, coordinator. Now, of course, at that point, you have a number of issues coming into picture. Number one, if you have one coordinator, so this is basically assuming that we have one coordinator. Now, number one, we know that it's the best solution. There is no doubt about that. Am I right? In other words, you have everything available. All the information is available, and you solve the problem simultaneously for everybody in the system. Now, it is going to be the best solution with respect to what, of course? With respect to, let's say, total system, let's say, profit or expected costs. In other words, it's not going to say anything about how this profit is going to be distributed among the actors. It will maximize the total expected profit. 
Okay? But at least we know that this is the largest total expected profit that we can get from the system. So this means that if we are trying to enlarge the cake that we want to eat, okay, this is the largest possible cake. Now the next step is, of course, how is this cake going to be distributed? Okay? Now, that, this is not a very simple problem, of course. But this is the best solution with respect to total system profit. Now, there are a lot of complications in reality. Different actors may have different objectives. For example, the, the Nike example is a good one. Now, of course, Nike is trying to maximize its profit. This is, of course, I mean, there is no doubt about it. Any doubts on that? Probably not. Okay. But uh, what is the role of this retail store? Now, I don't think that they really try to maximize the profit of the retail store. Because what, what the, the way that they utilize A as a retail store is probably to introduce certain items. You never see a lot of uh, markdown sales in these type of shops. Okay? You see a lot of technology, you see new product introduction, and it is a way actually to make everybody know their new products. So this is not basically after profit. So if we let this A to operate individually, they are not going to maximize their profit, but they will have other types of objectives. Now, similarly, these C's are doing wholesaling job, and they are, of course, in the long run, they want to maximize their profit, but in the short run, what they want is they want to get rid of their uh, competitors. They want to increase their market share. So you can see that if different actors can have different objectives. Now, this is one main complicating factor. Although we think that this is the best solution, the motivations of different actors might be different. So that's the reason why if you read a supply chain paper, they will also talk about a metric. Metric is actually a function that uh, measures different effect on a certain solution to different uh, actors, and it is a universally accepted value. Okay? There is no single metric in the supply chains that has this property, because objectives might be different. So there is no unique metric like best solution, expected total system profit, which is going to explain everything. Of course, there are certain supply chains which is operating on this premise. There is no doubt about it. But there will be some other supply chains which has very uh, different structure. And this means that if we are doing research and we are trying to do certain something which is general, then this not being there is going to create us a lot of problems. Now, the third issue, I think this is also an, an important issue, is that you always have this information availability problem. Now, the centralized solution assumes that you have all the information available for the system. So Nike, the coordinator, now we said that there is a coordinator. Now, where is this coordinator sitting? Okay, we usually expect that the coordinator is sitting here at the top, but it can be here as well. Think about Walmart. I mean, the coordinator in, in Walmart is probably more powerful than any other coordinator in the supply chain. But there is a coordinator. Now, the coordinator is expected to have all the information. What are the information re relating? Well, we want to have demand information. We want to have the individual cost information. Okay, if we really want to optimize the problem. Individual service understanding information. And in reality, if the ownership is not the same, okay, you definitely cannot obtain all this information. Number two, even if you have the same ownership, okay, think about uh, 
uh, firms that has all the that owns all the entities. It's, for example, think about uh, Coach Holding. Okay, Archelic is right over here, and then you have another firm which is doing the distribution, and then you have the retailers. Okay, now they all work for Coach Holding actually. But they are independent firms, and usually, even under those circumstances, to get the information, it may not be possible. Okay? They are under the same umbrella firm, but to get the information is not possible. So, information is not going to be available. So, the question is now, what is the value of the solutions that we obtain with Clark and Scarf? Well, it has the following value. At least if the metric is the agreed upon metric is total system profit which is generally the case not in every supply chain but in most of the supply chains it is the case it shows the size of the cake that can be reached now whether we will be able to reach that in a decentralized manner or make agreements so on and so forth is the scope of supply chains which is different than multi echelon inventory system. So multi echelon inventory systems only is going to supply the best solution for these type of problems. Now next thing is to investigate possibilities in how to attain that best solution by getting into some kind of an agreement. And we're going to see these type of issues later on in the semester. So you can see that what we obtained is a benchmark Okay, and that benchmark is actually a very valuable benchmark. Okay, any questions? We still have a few minutes. Okay. Uh, okay, then we're done. Uh, I think you were going to submit the homework, homework number two, and I have another homework coming in.